So we're gonna get started. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, we're gonna get started right now. Let me just grab my notes one second. Okay, so welcome everyone. Welcome to the first AP lecture. Thanks for making it out. We pretty much have everyone here. Um, so this lecture, we're gonna have the slides posted on the website. Uh, make sure that you, uh, it's, it's already posted on the website, so you guys can follow along. If you guys want, just go on the website and get the link, because to be honest, it will be a little bit in depth very soon, very quickly, so it'll be nice if you have the, the link to the slide with you. All right, so introductions. I hope you guys know me by now. Uh, my name's Eric. Um, I'm from Shanghai, China. I'm a third year electrical engineer, and I probably mentioned this many times, my favorite TV show. One of my favorite TV shows is The Last Airbender, and recently the other one is The Office. Um, I really like that show. I got introduced to it by someone like um, this during quarantine, and I've watched it already like twice, more than twice. I've rewatched a few episodes like three or four times, but yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Aaron. Uh, I'm from Las Vegas, and I'm a third year ECE major. And <clears throat> as you can see, I'm a recently indoctrinated anime addict. And uh, yeah, it was like at my internship this past summer where I was just really bored at work and I just started watching anime instead of doing what I should have been doing. And I also do play a lot of sports, but as a result, I'm always injured. And at least once a year, you'll find me on crutches. All right, so we're gonna start with logistics. I want you to listen to this part. Um, first few things are some things that we need from you guys uh, submitted. First thing is a signed syllabus. I don't know if you guys saw that I said to do that already, but I kind of just added the section where you can sign. Um, and you guys can just uh, message it to us um, and then that'll be okay. Um, and each member needs to pay a $60 deposit. You have to vet, uh, Venmo, UCLA, IEEE, it's also in the email. Um, and if you don't have a Venmo, then either make one because you're probably gonna need it in college all the time. Um, but if you don't wanna make one, then just talk to us. We'll figure something out. There's also a PayPal, but We'll, we'll deal with that if we get it. Um, I know a lot of you guys are on campus, and if you guys do want to use lab equipment, um, you guys need to complete the shop and lab safety training and then send that to us. And then if you want to go to the lab, you can talk to us about it, and then we can probably let you in, depending on what well, we'll figure something out with that, too. Um, the last thing is we kind of just made teams. Um, if you have difficulty contacting people in your group, if they didn't go show up to lecture, for example, today, um, then just talk to us, and we can come with a solution. Um, it's not a big deal. OK. A few other things. This is about events. First of all, this uh, Friday we're gonna have a project mixer social, and it's gonna be a like projects wide social with event with like all the projects in uh, in actually. I mean, this Friday at eight to nine. Right before that, we're gonna have a live demo, and I've kind of briefly talked about this before. And we're going to uh, basically demo because uh, all our labs right now are online for this quarter specifically. So in order for us to give you kind of a more interesting experience, we're having live demos. These are mandatory for you guys, um, but they're also not recorded because I thought it would be kind of boring for you guys to watch us like tinker with things. Um, it, it's going to be interactive. We're going to have you guys ask questions and it's kind of like experimenting with things. It's very fluid. Um, but the things we'll go over is uh, the topics that we're going over today, plus uh, a good intro to PID control uh, and uh, uh, kind of introducing that concept with motor drivers. Um, we have a uh, IEEE's workshop team is hosting a schematic design workshop on Monday. And I really, really, re really recommend you go to this, especially if you have never worked with PCBs and PCB design. And if you have like lightly, I definitely recommend you go to this. Um, we're not going to give too, many, too much direct resources in terms of how to do that, unless you guys ask specifically, but this will have a, a very strong, a give you a very strong understanding of what you need to know for our labs, uh, for our second lab. Um, lastly, just make sure you join, second to lastly, make sure you join all of our, all the things we talk about, Facebook group, Discord, and then website. Make sure you read all the announcements. So I put in the reason, one of the more recent announcements, like if you read to the end, comment your best friend's favorite cereal. And uh, we, I only had like two people comment to that other than officers. So, you know, I'm, I just want to make sure that everyone gets the announcement. So all the announcements on Facebook will typically be pretty important. So just make sure you guys check that. Um, and lastly, I made this on, uh, an anonymous feedback form. This quarter is definitely new to us, not only because we're obviously new AP leads, but also because um, it's never been hosted remotely. So we'll definitely have a lot of kinks here and there 
that we need to fill out. So if you have any problems, like feedback, if this lecture is super boring, super long, too easy, whatever, just you, you can post on that feedback form. Um, and we really appreciate if you do, because we, it's hard for us to know what to do if we don't uh, get feedback from you guys. Okay, uh, the other thing is you can follow this link for workshops. They asked us to show you this link. Um, this quarter, there'll be three major workshops. Um, we recommend you go to the one in week five, uh, the intro to PCB design, and that's really important for the topics that we're doing. We highly recommend pretty much everyone who hasn't done this before, unless you've like been MicroMouse, before, for example, um, we recommend you do this. Okay, now we're going to go into uh, lecture content. Before that, is there any questions from anyone about logistics? At any moment, you guys can like type in the chat, unmute yourself, so anything's fine. I don't know if you can see the chat. Oh, here we go. My bad. I didn't have a chat open. Switch groups. Mm. For the oh, syllabus. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, go for it, go. Uh, for the syllabus, uh, we're submitting it uh, with like one per group, right? And then what's the best way to send that in again? You can just uh, message it to us. We don't have too many teams, so it's not, okay. it's not a big deal. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, David Zeng, um, I'll talk, I can talk to you about that after, but um, yeah. All okay, right, uh, lecture content. So the things we're gonna go over today, first we already went over logistics. We're gonna talk a little bit briefly about the plans for this quarter. Um, and then in terms of technical content, it's gonna be pretty nitty gritty and physical. Um, and we're gonna be talking about motors, voltage sources, switches and transistors, and these three will accumulate into what we use as motor drivers in our, in our, in our quadcopter. All right, so first, the plans for the quarter. Um, we want to, wait one second, sorry. Right. So uh, firstly, uh, we want, we're kind of doing things differently this year. Normally we have like a lot of labs in the beginning and then you take that knowledge to make your board. However, we realized that other than the motor drivers, a lot of uh, the modules and the boards are just communicating with each other. So you don't exactly have to understand everything about sensors in order to know like, oh, the sensor is going to communicate with this other thing. So we're going to go over some of the basic important concepts that you need to understand in order to uh, basically uh, design your board. And our goal for the end of this quarter is to complete a schematic, which is the thing you see here on the left of your final board, which will eventually be uh, changed into this board, which is quite small, but um, it has everything you need to uh, build your quadcopter. And I want to add on to this. I do know that this year we have quite a few people coming from MicroMouse. And um, I know that a lot of you guys are interested in like other topics as well, especially since we're trying to leave a lot of space for people to have time to finish their schematic. But if this is like easy for you and you're also interested in uh, like more other stuff, we highly recommend that you go past or do other things other than what the baseline of what we say you need to do. So I know that someone is interested in like FPV things. Um, if you want to do things like that, definitely we're completely open to just going off with that and just letting us know, and then we'll we'll help, try to help you as best as we can because we don't want it to be you know too boring for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions about that? Nope. Okay. All right, let's talk about motors. We're gonna get into the top the first more academic topic. Um, all right, so stop me at any time. This is definitely going to be, uh, everyone's going to be at different experience levels. So don't be afraid to, to stop and ask questions if I say something that doesn't really make sense. Um, so first of all, why do we need to talk about motors? So first of all, we, we hope that your drones will be able to fly. And if you don't want to fly, then go to MicroMouse because they don't get to fly. But I mean, they'd have motors too. Um, it's just that um, we have a much more stringent uh, requirement in terms of how we control our, mo our motors. So the things that we need to be able to understand with our motors is one, we have to be able to supply enough torque and power to lift the drones off the ground. That's a given. That probably makes sense to most of you. And the second thing is that we need a w wish to control our output. Um, we're going to kind of go over how we're going to do this uh, during this lecture. So the first, uh, I think it's great to start uh, for any electrical engineer on the baseline of what motors are um it physically in uh in a physical sense um so motors are basically uh, set, sets of coils that are powered with some kind of current uh, voltage across it that generates a current and for those of you who are taking physics classes should know that 
um, given uh, a current moving in a magnetic field, it would generate uh, a force on the wire. And we orient it in this kind of uh, circular armature uh, orientation that we show in the bottom right, then it will generate a torque. So at the top of the arc when it's spinning, um, the current will reverse and that will maintain the orientation of the magnetic force. And uh, I, I, many of you have probably seen this, so I'm not going to go too in depth on it because, um, but it's basically uh, the right hand rule, you kind of see how the force uh, uh, spins the uh, turns the motor. So the circuit model of a motor is what we're really interested in. And we take a lot of the model based on the, the physical uh, uh, values that are uh, in the in this phenomenon. So, uh, firstly, DC motors, which is what we're using, DC being direct current, um, can be modeled by a resistor, an inductor, and a dependent voltage source. So a resistor is just any wire, especially in this case, very long wires. If you open up a motor, there's tons of wires in it. It would have a, a quite a large, a good, a good, a good amount of resistance in it. Um, and then there will be an inductor, obviously a, a self-inductance due to the coils of wire. And then there's going to be a dependent voltage source. And this is probably, uh, if you haven't really studied it, it might be kind of confusing. But it just means that the, it, there will be a voltage source, just like a battery, that is dependent on some physical factor. In this case, it is the angular velocity of your motor. And the reason we have this is because uh, if you were to think about Faraday's law, as your uh, motor is turning, there's going to be a change in magnetic flux, which will generate a voltage across your two leads. Um, and this will generate a voltage that will be calculated within your circuit. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's another person. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask a few questions here. So firstly, uh, if we were to take a look at the, the circuit values, like the current voltage, um, resistance, inductance, what should the torque be related to? And anyone can unmute and answer this. No one unmutes. I'm gonna have to do the thing where I call on people. <laughs> uh, okay, sure, I'll do it. So I think it is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. That is true. That is completely true. Um, there's another thing that's going to be related to. In that case, it's not something that we can, that that's completely true. Like I, I realize this question is very vague, but it's not something that we would control within our circuit because that's uh, predetermined by the manufacturer. But I feel like you're onto something. So do you know what the other kind of uh, variable is in the torque. Uh, how about how much current you're passing through it? Yes, exactly. So it, it'll be, uh, the, the torque will be directly be related to uh, the, the current and for the equation it'll be uh, the, the charge, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, the magnetic field times the current times the length in this case of, of, of your wire. And this is important for us to understand if we take a step back, that just means that if we want to be able to drive our drone, to, especially if we're doing with larger drones and just drones in general, like if we want to drive enough uh, torque and power into uh, our, our system, we need to make sure that there's a lot of current. And when we have a lot of current, we have to understand that uh, where this current is passed through, we need to make sure there's not a lot of resistance and we are that our source is able to supply this current if we want to do that. So yeah, great. Uh, the second question is, what would the voltage a lot across this dependent source be related to in the armature? And I kind of went over this already. The angular momentum or something? Yeah, angular velocity. So that would be the change in angle over change in time. Um, because your change in angle would result in, if you haven't seen motors, there would be like a, a linear magnetic field, in this case, in a simplified model. Um, and when, as you, uh, uh, your armature rotates, the area that it intersects uh, becomes smaller. So uh, in a DC motor, it's related to the angular velocity. And it, it, I know that, uh, in this simplified model, it's like not exactly that. But when you look at a motor inside, there's actually many different coils of wires. And as electrical engineers, we don't necessarily have to understand like fully how the physical aspect works, but uh, how we, it applies to our circuit. But yeah, you're on the right track. It's uh, the angular velocity, which means that um, in order to, if you want to control this, this is important. So uh, because if we want to control the speed of our motor, we have to control the voltage across it. right? Okay, and it, it's quite interesting. Oh, oops, I asked my question. Oh, so if we write um, here that your your uh, EMF or the voltage across your dependent source is k times your uh, angular velocity, and your torque is 
propor uh, proportional to your current. Uh, the, the two K values are actually the same because they're completely geometrical and have to deal with the mutual inductance. Um, it's not too important for you to understand, but if you're interested, there's a lot of math behind it that explains how exactly energy is transferred that is self-consistent. The last thing I kind of want to mention, and this is more towards people who have taken classes like 10, 110, 141, um, is that uh, for most, so if you don't understand it, if you're like a freshman, for example, it's okay. Um, but it's just for you know, conceptually understand that motors will have obviously a lot of inertia and thus long transients, right? Since we said that the uh, voltage across the motor is related to um, its speed, its speed can't change instantaneously. Just like if you had a capacitor with the resistor in series, then your the charge on your capacitor can't change instantaneously. So in a sense, the motor actually acts, like, acts as a low pass filter. And this is important in our circuit and we'll talk about that in a, in a second. Cool. So any questions about that? That was pretty much everything about motors that we need to talk about. We good? Okay. Uh, and also, don't worry, guys. I'll give you guys a break some, some, uh, very soon. So yeah, I know it's like quite uh, heavy. Uh, we're going to talk about voltage sources. For us, a voltage source is a battery. Uh, when we model an ideal voltage source, all it means is that it's able to supply a desired voltage at any current across of it. And batteries kind of help us model that pretty well. Um, however, uh, nucleos and uh, STM, uh, the STM32 MCUs, which is the the uh, microcontroller units that we're using, do do not um, output enough current for us to drive motors. And that's because these pins are normally used as digital pins and don't have a uh, have a really high output impedance. Um, I, the nucleo recommends that they output a maximum of 120 milliamps, but for our motors that we're using, they each draw about uh, 500 milliamps uh, and up to two, two amps when it's uh, stalled. So um, we need batteries in order to power the motor. And if you don't know what batteries are, then please talk to us. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, but well, the thing with the battery is that the way that, uh, because of the way it's designed, we can't control its output because then it wouldn't really be a good voltage source. Um, so we use the microcontroller to control the speed and we're gonna go over how that works. Now, the way we do that is having uh, switches. Um, and if you've done anything in ops or micromalice, you probably know this term PWM. Um, and I know someone in here probably knows what it is. So can someone explain it to me? I, I didn't want to kind of beat a dead horse. Um, I, I guess I can. So pulse width modulation is a way to approximate an analog signal with only on and off. So for example, if something's on 25% of the time and off for 75% of the time, it'll approximate a signal of 25%. Right, exactly. Now, I, and you probably heard that like, if you do that with like an LED, you'll see the LED dim. However, what's actually happening is that um, it, it is on and off and on and off. So there, it, it never is actually at that, um, that exact number, right? So if you were to, uh, like take a high speed camera and zoom in on it, it would actually be turning on and off. So, but then to our naked eye, it looks like it's just getting dimmer. So here's a question for you guys. Is it okay, when we design our motors, now uh, I know that with the LED, like it doesn't really matter because we don't see it with our naked eye, but since we're dealing with this physical system, is it okay that we turn the motor on and off? So our propellers are turning, like, turning on and turning off. And will, how, uh, will this affect our performance um, or will it be able to give us a, still a uniform speed? This is definitely a, a more difficult question. When you're turning the motor off, it only turns off like the force that's driving the rotors forward, right? So won't the, like, the rotational like uh, momentum just carry on and it won't really be too affected? Exactly. So that's what I was talking about with the uh, motors being a low pass filter and having long transients. It basically means that the motor itself can't uh, uh, instantaneously shut off, you know, just because it has inertia. So that's completely, that's completely right. That's exactly the right the answer I was looking for. And so what that means is that normally, if we were to try to output like a signal properly, you would have to filter it um, with like uh, to take the average value of the voltage with maybe some some low pass filter. But in this case, we don't have to because the motor itself acts as a low pass filter. Another way you can think of it is if the motor is spinning. Um, even if you turn the voltage source off, it would still provide a voltage uh, through the uh, backwards, through the uh, dependent voltage source. 
And in that sense, uh, your voltage itself has a very long transient to it. Um, yeah. OK, cool. That's like the first half of our lecture. Um, I think we're, we're going through it pretty well. Um, we're going to give you guys a little bit of a break for you guys to meet your groups. Um, first thing, uh, during this break, um, the team form, uh, we updated it. Oh, God, I, I don't put a space there. But if you can go on the website or anything or the Facebook group, where oh I didn't put it on the website yet that's my fault but on the Facebook group you have the team forms um, and also on the on this slide you can just copy and paste that from the space but uh, it, it'll have numbers on them now so then I think Aaron made breakout rooms and then you can just join the breakout room with your number on it but before you guys go make sure you guys exchange contact information beforehand because we're not going to um, force you guys after but we probably will but um, then just some icebreakers I guess talk about say your name your major, your year, uh, the top three ways or just however ways you use your time um, during summer and quarantine and how much of that time, how much of your time was consumed by those activities. And then if you want, you can talk about your favorite AP lead. Um, and then after that, you guys can make a team messenger group and then I make a team messenger group with me and Aaron as well. Make sure to make these two separate ones um, because we want to be able to talk to you guys about uh, project, uh, labs and projects later on. Um, but you can do that after the lecture even too that doesn't really matter but yeah you guys can join the breakout rooms now let me know if you guys can see it right yeah yeah D david jane you, you can stay in the main room until everyone leaves I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about it but yeah everyone knows you guys see the breakout rooms yeah can you can you can you guys see the breakout rooms i think i opened them already i have oh. no idea how to get into a breakout room like, yeah are you on the bottom on the bottom bar of your screen, there should be like a breakout room button. Uh, yeah, we don't see that referent now. Yeah, we don't see that. Is there oh. more and then join breakout room? Let me try it, wait. I think you guys have to assign us to a breakout room. Oh, I think I made it so that you can, you can, can click join. join. You can yeah. click join here. Um, the, he, We put your names on actually, because so Aaron is a genius. Um, do you guys see it? Um, not seeing it, no. Go to more, like the three dots. Oh, I'll, I'll just close it and then I'll just assign people to them. Okay. Real quick. Um, in that case, yeah, I'm in more. I don't see anything here. Okay. In that case, we can keep going for a little bit, I guess, if you guys aren't too tired. <laughs> um, and then Aaron, just let me know when that's done. Okay. Uh, okay. So, right before we went into that pseudo break, um, we were talking about switches, um, and that's kind of how we want to control uh, our output <clears throat> battery is being able to turn it on and off, uh, with PWM. So an example of me mechanical switches, there's a lot of them. There's push buttons, relays, switches. However, we're not going to use those, obviously, because we're not going to physically press them. And also, uh, just from an electrical standpoint, they're slow and bouncy, per se, which means that the mechanical um, like arm bounces and causes your signal to kind of fluctuate. But anyways, we, we definitely need something more suited for this. Uh, and the way we're going to do that is with transistors. Um, there's two type of main types of transistors I use. Uh, Similar concepts, but uh, kind of have a, a bit of a different uh, physical descriptions for them. There's BJTs and uh, FETs. Uh, BJTs are uh, controlled by current. Uh, each of your your um, transistors will have three pins. There will be an emitter, a source. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, emitter. Uh, uh, there's many different. Uh, there's like a few different ways you can name it. There's emitter, gate, and a uh, source. Oh, no, collector, sorry, emitter, gate, collector. And there is a, a source, gate, and drain. So BJCs will use source, um, gate, and drain. Um, and typically, you're limited to very small amounts of currents because of the way the physics works. However, they're much less expensive than FETs. Um, and uh, they also have shorter switching times, which uh, isn't too important for us to understand because we're only going to be using FETs in our case. Um, FETs are voltage controlled, which means the gate takes a voltage signal and that is what drives current. Um, and then it'll be able to uh, handle much higher currents than BJT. So if you were to try to drive a motor, which I did in my first year idea hacks, um, with a BJT, it'll like burn up. Uh, so then, is it, yeah, is it, oh, the breakout rooms are good? Okay, yeah. I'll just, just, yeah, slide you just finish up the slide. And then... Yeah, and then. Um, however, they do have long switching times, but as we said in our case, um, well, in, in terms of our motor, it's totally within reason, so that's okay. Well, okay, we can go into breakout rooms now just to 
yeah, I'll go back to the slide with the uh, icebreaker. Just gonna remember before you go. Yeah, you guys can join the breakout rooms now. Hey, Eric, do you want me to do the slides, pick up on the slides after the break? Sure, you can do that, yeah. I'll go through to drivers. Do you want to do drivers? Yeah, I definitely. I can I can go through drivers as well. Yeah, I might interject a little bit on the operation perspective thing, but. OK, then I, guess I still I'll... don't. Sorry to interrupt. I just still don't see the breakout room button at the bottom of the Zoom meeting. You see a. a... Like um under more. Actually, it might just be me. Wait, did I forget to hold on? Wait, uh how do I ah sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> um how do I wait, this is so weird. Wait, Daniel, are you in the group with uh Justin? Justin and Julian? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. I may have forgotten to add you into that. <laughs> That's okay. All right. I'd like to switch from group two to group one. Right. So, oh, so the thing with that now is that uh, it's kind of awkward because when we do that, we'll have to change someone back over. Yeah. Um, Wait. So are you friends with people in group one? Is that? Yeah, I'm friends with someone in group one, so I'd like to switch. Okay, one of them. Okay. Aaron, what do you think? Right. Yeah, so like, I think there's three people in group one and four in group two. So if we switch, it'll basically be still three and four. four. Oh, are you, in, are you in group two? Yeah, so oh, yeah, I'm in group right, two. Well. So. Okay, yeah, I think that's fine. That's, that's kind of cool. Is that okay, Aaron? Uh, yeah, it, I need to wait for the breakout rooms to close before I can assign Daniel into another. What? Oh, do, wait. Oh, yeah. are, you, are you redoing the breakout room? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I man. To assign <laughs> Daniel into a breakout room. <laughs> nice. Yes, lots of small mistakes. Uh, oh, shoot. Options. Okay. Daniel. There you go. Now the room should be open. Um, David, about uh, about like the reassigning of the team, we'll, we'll get back to you on that as soon as possible after this lecture. Okay. Yes. So uh, can you guys put me in one of the breakout rooms? Yeah, you're in, uh, you're currently assigned to breakout room two right now. Yeah, but on the bottom, I don't see like... Yeah, it, the, the breakout rooms are currently closed. I'm going to send open them again right now. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. How long do you want to keep the breakout rooms open? Um, you I, I guess like in two minutes, I'll close them. I, I mean, I'm going to hop in one and just check what they think. Yeah, well, let's go to, let's go to the William David Jack one. Oh yeah, by the way, so do you want me to just go like through the rest of switches and like transitions yeah. to die? Yeah, to go over the rest of the switches with semiconductor stuff. You, you get the semiconductor stuff, right? Yeah. And then did and you say you to do drivers, right? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do drivers. Okay. Um, and yeah. And then I guess I'll do final announcements. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, second lecture, you'll definitely go go over more than me too, because because. Yeah. Let's go to uh, let's go to D Jack because David didn't join his. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go visit Jack. Hello. Oh. Rose. I think 
think that's everyone already, Eric. Wait, did that break our post? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Are you going? Uh, oh, wait, I'm not on the right side. Uh, We're on switches? Yeah, right here. Okay. Yeah, so uh, continuing on what Eric was talking about. So we'll give like a brief little introduction to semiconductors and you'll learn more about the, like the whole doping. And so if you hear like all these different terms, you'll learn about them a lot more in depth than like the EE2 series. So like two and then 121 and then like 123, those classes. But so we'll give you like a really base level uh, information regarding semiconductors where, so transistors are made out of like silicon dipped with, doped with impurities. And the reason silicon is so useful in, uh, in semiconductors is because they can easily form lattice structures due to the fact that they have four valence electrons, a little bit of chemistry there. And however, like silicon by itself, it can't conduct current, which is why we dope them with Im impurities uh, to allow current to flow based on different conditions. And so we have two types of silicon, N-type and P-type. And th these are like the two primary types of doping where N-type is doped with donor atoms, which results in excess electrons, allowing the material to conduct current. Whereas P-type silicon is doped with like acceptors or some people call them holes. And these uh, carriers allow, these like my acceptor carriers allows uh, the material to conduct current. And so uh, since we're going to be using FETs, we'll go over like how they work. So in the image in the top right, you'll see like a, a cross section of uh, FET. So you have the source and drain contacts along with a P substrate on the bottom, along with uh, two N-doped like, uh, N -doped regions, which is where the source and drain are connected to. And a, like, a thin metal oxide layer is what separates the, uh, the gate from the P substrate. And for FETs, it's the voltage between the gate and the source that controls whether or not the current is able to flow from the source to drain. And it's uh, blocked because of the different doping from the, between the N and the P regions of the semiconductor. And this, this change in voltage creates a region between the drain and source with the same doping, which is what allows the current to flow. And down on the bottom, we have the two types of uh, transistors, NMOS and PMOS, and they vary based on their, the doping. So NPN for NMOS and PNP for PMOS. And going more into the difference between the two, we'll start with NMOS. And so NMOS transistors, the source is negative and the drain is positive and the current is driven by a positive potential difference between the gate and source. And you'll see in the two images that like it's the voltage, the, the voltage that's allowing the current to flow is the gate and source voltage. And with PMOS, the, it's essentially flipped. So the source becomes positive and the drain becomes negative and the current is driven by a negative potential difference between the gate and source. And right. with regards to, oh, wait, okay, let me go over this part, okay. Um, right, so, and just notice that uh, with both the PMOS and NMOS, uh, that uh, it is the gate source voltage. Um, and, but in the NMOS, because it's, uh, it, uh, the N side is built with donor atoms, the source is gonna be electrons. And then in PMOS, the source will be a hole, which is positive charge, just the lack of electrons. In both cases, you're looking at the gate source voltage. Um, this is kind of how I see it, um, you have, uh, kind of three major regions that we lo look at when we're dealing with transistors, at least in our, in our, in our uses. Um, uh, you'll have this thing called the threshold voltage, which is, defined, which is defined by the manufacturer. And if your uh, gate source voltage is in an NMOS uh, is less than the threshold voltage, meaning, for example, if your, your, your gate and source is the same voltage, then there will be no current flow. Um, we'll typically be using NMOSs. They're more popular, and we'll kind of go over why. Um, so I'll kind of go more in depth with this for a bit. Um, the, if the gate source, source voltage is larger than the threshold voltage, 
um, and, and let's just ignore the second part for now, then it, the, the transistor will behave like resistor. However, if your gate source voltage is larger than your threshold voltage and your, uh, your um, drain source voltage, meaning the opposite side, um, is uh, greater than your gate source voltage minus V threshold, and um, this is kind of a specific number dealing with the, the diode behavior, then uh, you have this uh, saturation current, which means that there's constant current from the drain um, to the source. And the way you can think about it is uh, with uh, this is kind of, in a sense, can behave like two diodes next to each other. And when you have the gate source as the highest potential and the sides as um, lowest, then uh, then your two diodes are forward biased and they would be shorted. Um, so normally that's why you have to have a, a resistor on the end, but we'll talk about that later. But typically, um, uh, our MOSFETs will generally operate within this linear uh, region, which if you look at uh, Actinia would also be called the active region. Um, right, go over specifics right now. Um, so for example, let's have a PMOS in this case with a threshold voltage of uh, negative one. And remember that the threshold voltage would be negative for a PMOS, um, be just from convention. And the power supply has uh, 3.7 volts as shown in the diagram. Um, uh, right. If we were to uh, have the uh, a PWM and a PWM output, when uh, the voltage at is high on the PWM, then your gate source voltage, which is the voltage between 3.7 and your PWM, will be 3.7 minus 3.7, which is greater than negative one. And in this case, there will be no current flowing. Um, and uh, if your PWM is off, then your gate source voltage will be zero, um, which is uh, less than your uh, threshold voltage. Uh, uh, your gate source voltage will be zero, and then the difference from um, the power supply would be negative 3.7, which is less than your threshold voltage. And then in this case, it would behave like resistor. So as we can see from this, that um, as you alternate uh, from PWM, um, you can turn the uh, power supply on and off. And this is just a second, uh, pers oh, oops, second perspective of kind of how uh, of how people look at it. Um, you might see it, and it might be confusing, so I just left it on here. I won't talk too much about it. But it's kind of looking at the, neg the negative values of PMOS and NMOS. If you look at the difference, it's basically uh, in this case I said uh, the gate source voltage is greater than the threshold, and in in this case, I said the source gate voltage is less than negative D threshold, which is everything being negated. Um, it's just another perspective that people will talk about it if you Google things. So I just want to make sure you knew this um, in case you ever uh, Google stuff, which you definitely will. But yeah. Let me talk about drivers. Actually, Aaron, you want to talk about this part? <laughs> OK, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, going on to motor drivers, we have we we require something called a flyback diode in our circuit, right? And so you can think of the motor itself as an inductor. And as you've learned, I believe it's like physics one B or one C or both classes. Inductors they want to maintain their current after you like well you you know those questions where it's like what happens to the circuit? What, what's like the current in the circuit after like right after a switch is closed or a switch is open? And inductors they want to maintain their current, right? And so when the MOSFET closes the change in current goes towards negative infinity, di dt, and the voltage across the motor goes to negative infinity as a result. And the voltage across the transistor reaches positive infinity. And you can see why like all of these infinities are suboptimal for our, uh, for our overall circuit. So yeah, if we add it, that's what we need a thing called flyback diode. Um, if you were to short a uh, uh, inductor, then it would create a large voltage across it. And we're basically trying providing the path so that the, the current won't um, instantly short. And it will, instead, will slowly circulate and have a reasonable voltage across it in the diode. Um, so with diodes, for those of you who don't, don't know, if you can look at this diagram, mainly focus on the first quadrant. Um, if you have no voltage across, uh, uh, across it, um, obviously, there's uh, no current going across it. And at a uh, threshold voltage, it'll turn on and you can, uh, it, uh, it'll be in forward bias and basically act like a short. In reverse, however, um, this is 
a very skewed uh, diagram. If you look at the threshold voltage, it's about 0 0.7 volts. And here in breakdown, where it starts uh, conducting current in the opposite way, is about negative 50 volts. So typically, we'll never reach that, um, meaning that uh, in a reverse bias, where in this case, for example, where we have 7.4 here, um, and then this is reverse bias, where the positive side is at this bar over here, um, then there'll be no current conducting through it. So in this case, it'll only accept current basically coming from the motor and not from your power supply. Um, so during normal operation, the doubt axis in an open, and then that axis is a, a short when the, the uh, transistors uh, switch off. All right, so we're gonna talk about drivers. This is the most basic concept of what a driver would look like. Um, in order to make a low side driver, you would want to place the NMOS between the trans uh, transistor between the motor and ground. And the most important thing is that your uh, source is next to ground. And the reason for that is because when we're looking at trying to turn the uh, transistor on, we look at the gate to source voltage, right? When I was uh, uh, first starting out in, in freshman year doing idea hacks, I think, um, and nothing was working because I thought you could just turn, like switch them around and it would be fine because you normally switch LEDs and resistors around doesn't really make a difference. In this case, it does because your reference of what your gate voltage is, is a potential difference. For example, this PWM being connected to a microcontroller would be referenced to the same ground. Now, if you were to move this up, then you don't know what this, side's voltage is right across because it'll be across the motor. So you would have to connect the transistor between the motor and ground. Then you would use the nucleo or your whatever MCU that you use um, to control the NMOS transistor. And just remember that when you're coding, that's only some pins and also designing your circuit boards, um, only some pins can perform PWM because they need a, an internal timer to do so. So you have to check the pinouts before you design it um, and before you uh, try to add, access the code. And in this way, you can turn the motor on and off continuously. Having a higher duty cycle means your average voltage will be higher, meaning your motor will spin faster. Lower duty cycle means slower. That's uh, pretty intuitive, I think. All right, this is where it gets kind of more interesting. Um, you have these things called high side drivers. Um, and there's a lot of technical reasons why you would want to use a high side driver. And if you're interested, you can come talk to me after. Um, but in order to do so, and we really want you to understand it, even though it's not, we're not using it in our drone because this is useful in just like any electrical engineering interview kind of, um, you would want to place a PMOS between the, the, the uh, power supply and your PWM, right? So using, you would use, uh, it would be the exact same thing. However, in this case, you would have flip logic where if your uh, PWM is high, then your uh, gate source voltage would be zero, and then the the voltage will uh, sorry the transistor will switch off. Uh, and so in this case, higher duty cycle, which means that it's on for longer, makes the motor spin slower, and the lower duty cycle makes it spin faster. So it has exactly flip logic. One more thing before we go on to talk a little more about high side drivers is the, uh, the concept of pull up and pull down resistors. And this is really important for pretty much everything, but also a little bit difficult to understand at first. Um, if you were to think about this pull down resistor here not existing, you would have a gate and the gate would um, not let current flow typically. Um, so if you were to, for example, to, uh, have a PWM output here that would deposit some charge onto the gate um, and then switch it off, then you have this thing called a floating pin where you don't actually know what the state of your gate is. It could be at like, uh, like 3.7 volts, it could be at zero. You don't really know and you can't control it, which is really bad. Um, so typically you would want to have a uh, pull the voltage down when there's no input and it basically provide a path for a uh, charge to move. Um, and in this case, uh, if your PWM is high, then uh, the voltage across the resistor would increase. So your gate uh, voltage would be shorted exactly to your PWM output. If it's low, then the, the charge on the gate will like drain through and essentially pull the voltage down to ground. So here's a question. I know I haven't had asked a question in a bit, but uh, for a high side driver, should we use a pull up or a pull down resistor? And can you explain explain why you might think that? Anyone? Can I answer again? Yeah, no problem. Don't worry. Uh, I think you should use a pull up resistor. Right. And why do you think that? Uh, because uh, I think it's going to be flipped, right? 
So you would want to like make the different zeros. So you would want to pull it up. Right, exactly. Because in this case, we're comparing the gate voltage to the source, which is ground. In a high side driver, you'd want to compare the gate voltage with the, the power supply voltage, uh, which is the also the source voltage. Um, and you want to make that zero. And if you don't do that and connect to the ground the same way that you do here, then when you turn your uh, your your uh, MCU or your PWM output off, then it's just going to keep running, which is really which you don't want to happen, right? If you don't you don't want like if your uh, MCU like crashes or something, that the default output would just be your motor spinning like crazy, which is kind of unsafe. Um, so you'd always want to use a, a, a pull up resistor if you're using high side driver. Oh, I just did that. I don't know why I made the other slide. Um, right, so we kind of went over this. Um, there are these things called strong pull-up resistors and uh, weak pull-up resistors. Um, lower resistance are, are stronger because they draw more current and will pull harder than high resistances. So in this case, if we were to think about this PWM uh, pin, right, um, let's just take the, the, the case that this resistor is, uh, the resistance is zero, then this point is always short to here and will always be ground. However, it, we're not going to do that, obviously. But uh, if you had a, a nucleo pin, for example, on here with a certain pin resistance, this would act as a voltage divider. And you would want the resistance here to be lower so that your uh, it would uh, basically the voltage di divider equation will make it so that it would pull closer to ground than, um, if you, than otherwise, yeah. So in that case, you uh, just a rule of thumb, you always want the pull up, uh, pull up or pull down resistor to be one tenth, at least one tenth of the magnitude of the internal pin resistance. So, right, you can think of voltage divider. However, you don't want to make it too small, like for example, shorting it because you'll draw way more current and if you uh, and thus more power, which you don't want to do. Okay, we're almost done with drivers, so bear with me. This is definitely a more technical topic right here. Um, one of the problems with high side drivers is, is that if you were to have your uh, nucleo or MCU like have a output of let's say like 3.3 volts, you can never get to the point where the gate source voltage reaches zero. And that here in this case, uh, when your PWM signal is high, for example, with uh, 3.3, your source gate voltage would be uh, 4.1 volts, which is still greater than negative two and will always be on. So if you want to run a high side driver on a um, on a uh, microcontroller, you would need to have a higher voltage. And the way we do that is called an inverting level shifter. And the way we do it is basically a NMOS driver connected to a uh, PMOS driver. If we connect an NMOS like in the, like this um, with a pull up resistor. Then we can arrange our voltage from ground up to, uh, or threshold voltage if you're more technical with it, from ground up to uh, 7.4 volts. And that's how we are able to um, uh, act, uh, use a high side driver when we're uh, uh, using a microcontroller. Cool, that's all technical questions. I know that end part was especially long um, and however that was an important part. So if you guys have any questions, ask now. I'm sure everyone has some questions or you guys are just all smarter than me. No questions? Okay, that's fine. We'll be in lab um, during our lab hours. I might change my lab hours so I can make sure I can be there more often. So uh, make sure to check the hours again if you're trying to come. Um, but you can definitely ask us questions as you're working in the lab. So thanks for listening for that part. Um, we're just going to go over the rest of the stuff that have to do with the lab. Um, as you should have seen on the syllabus, uh, you'll have to complete labs to finish AP. And this is kind of, if you don't complete labs, and you kind of don't complete anything. So um, our first lab will be on motor drivers. Hopefully, it'll be a good kind of introduction lab for you guys. Um, lab spec actually is already posted. Um, it's on the website under lab spec, I think. Um, but I might also post on Facebook. I'm not sure. Um, the first two checkpoints will be due. Uh, next Monday. And I know it sounds pretty soon, but one, we want to give you as much time as you can on SCMAS. That's the hardest part. And two, it's really not that long. And then the third checkpoint will be due that Wednesday. Um, so meet with your groups and do that. Uh, I recommend you guys make like the Zoom call or even meet in the Discord uh, call and work there. And that way we can help you guys. 
Um, if you guys do have a Zoom meeting and want to sit on it, you can let me know. Uh, and yeah. So the, what you need to do is use Tinkercad. I know some of you, if you went to the uh, 3D printing uh, workshop earlier, that there, you know how to, uh, that Tinkercad exists. It's basically an online uh, modeling kind of software service um, from Autodesk. And there's a circuits component that helps you uh, design circuits and also simulate them, which is really useful for us when we're just introducing this. Um, so you're going to have to use, make both high side and low side motor drivers. Um, and then secondly, we're going to have to introduce you to submitting a bill of materials. If you're ever to even join IEEE, IEEE as like an officer or just in general, if you're doing anything um, project oriented, you, you would have to submit a bill of materials that has all your parts and all your prices um, of what you choose. And for in our case, you're going to be choosing pretty much all the parts on your own. Um, so we're going to need that from you. Um, in this case, we're introducing that to you by letting you guys choose MOSFETs for your actual board. And then there will be lab checkoff questions. So when you finish your lab, you're not complete uh, completed with it until you check, uh, do checkoff questions with us. Um, sorry. Right. Uh, someone asked if, you, if they could buy a motor driver integrated circuit. I would suggest not. Um, there's no point, first of all. The reason that we're, uh, motor driver ICs work is because you want to be able to flip your digital logic um, so you can output both in the opposite direction and the forward direction. With uh, propellers, you would never do that. Um, so it takes up a lot more space than what this would be and is, um, will require much, many more nets and wires than you need. So I would suggest against it. If you want to, I go. it's your board. I don't, I don't mind. Anyway, sorry for that. Uh, someone asked that question if they, should, if they can buy a motor driver integrated circuit for their board. But yeah, um, you're not done until you finish your lab checkoff questions um, with us. And you have to do that before the day. Uh, yeah. Cool. With Tinkercad, we're going to give you a mini tutorial. If you have an Arduino or a Nucleo, which I'm sure a lot of you are, or if you're uh, near campus and you want to do hands-on stuff, um, we can uh, you can tell us and we can probably get it delivered to you or something. And we can check you off online. Uh, uh, online, but you can do it like physically if you wanted. But still try to work with your group and uh, do it together. <clears throat> and then, um, but yeah, otherwise you can do it uh, using Tinkercad. Secondly, with choosing parts, um, you have to choose parts with proper specifications. Don't just use a random part. All the details will be written on the lab. One thing I want to make note of is that this part will be used on your actual board. So typically, you'll, you've probably seen components like this that are through hole, which means that they're like wires on the end, versus surface mount, which are like this, uh, which are also called SMD. You want to make sure you look for things that are SMD footprint, because they're going to be using them for a PCB, a print circuit board. Um, and at the end of this, uh, hopefully you guys will all choose pretty reasonable parts. And I'm expecting that a lot of you guys will choose the same parts. So the most common or reasonable parts will end up using for everybody, just to simplify ordering for us. OK, final announcements. Uh, we recommend that you go to the workshop once again, because our schematic will be very complicated. And we don't want you to be stuck on like the functions of how to use Eagle in the first place. Um, so we definitely recommend going to that. There will be an, a live demo this week on Friday for those of you who can come. Um, but uh, and it'll kind of go over how to implement control systems. And then definitely reach out if you have any help. We'll, we're always here to help, um, kind of our job. Um, and re don't wait till the end to ask us anything. Definitely be proactive. Um, we won't know if you're struggling unless you tell us you're struggling. Um, if you don't make the cutoff of the day, we have to keep going. So there's a possibility we might drop you. But um, definitely, if you communicate with us beforehand, we can figure anything out. Yeah. Yeah. Also, one thing I wanted to add was that for the bill of materials, don't don't like get too worried about like having every single component for your aerocopter or quadcopter on your bill of materials by the end of like this uh, this lab assignment. It's just like for the parts relevant for uh, this specific lab, and we're going to be going over uh, more components and circuits of the uh, quadcopter next lecture in like three or four weeks. And then there's lab hours. Uh, if you haven't seen the lab document, uh, there's a document with all the lab hours on it. I don't know if you guys saw it from other posts, but I'll try to post that actually. I should remember to do that. Um, and if uh, you can't make it to our lab hours typically, you can just schedule it with us and we can figure a time out too. You can get checked off. But yeah, uh, that's all. Any final questions? I know that was a relatively long lecture. It would normally be shorter than that. Um, just because we had time with breakout rooms and things like that. But uh, 
uh, and it's also the first lecture. So uh, thanks for bearing with us. Um, any last questions? I'll forever hold your peace. <laughs> specs on a motor. What? Uh, do you have any specs for the motor? Yes, they're going to be on the lab, and the lab is posted on the website. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, and we'll, uh, it'll, you'll have the specs for your motor and also for your microcontroller, and you should be able to have enough information to decide on how you're going to design your, your uh, drivers. Um, for the messenger groups, um, do we have to have both you and Aaron in, uh, included in them? Yeah, you can have, hopefully, yeah, definitely have one with us, and you can also make one outside. That's just for us to communicate with you later on when we have design reviews and stuff. By the way, when you guys make the group chat, can you label it with your with your team name, um, uh, or just team number? I have names fine, but yeah, preferably the team number, um, so we can see it. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest with you. I've never used Messenger before, so. <laughs> oh man, well, get used to it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, what is the deal with every? Everyone using like Facebook at UCLA, like, why is Facebook such yeah, a big thing just, here? I know it's just the way it, it, most people are on it. Honestly, yeah, I don't, I don't get it either. Like where I'm from, nobody used freaking Messenger, and then here, like, ev almost everything is done through Messenger. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, I think I'll stick around for a little bit longer. If anyone has any questions, personal questions, technical questions, anything, I'll stay along for, stay on for a little, another like five minutes. But you guys are all free to leave. Thanks for coming. I know it was a kind of late and but I really volunteered himself for hot seat. Yeah. Cool. I'm gonna get my curry if no one has any questions. That why is there so, so many people here? Everyone just want to listen to the questions or they want to listen to me talk. 